Thank you for leading that. I appreciate everybody uh, stepping up and doing uh, what has been asked of them or what they feel is they've been called to do or what they feel like they could volunteer to do. Um, I This place couldn't function without everybody doing their part. Um, and I know it's not a... I don't always need to call attention to what we aren't anymore uh, or what I should say aren't yet what we will be. Um, but um, it's uh, there's um, something in weightlifting where they say... Um, it's not vain, or, or if you're into um, uh, bodybuilding, which uh, that's not not really into that. You can tell I'm more like into food, <laughs> tacos, and whatnot. Um, but uh, they they talk about a visualization. You know, see, look at yourself. That's why they put a lot of mirrors in there. It's not because it's all vain, but it, there's something in, in gyms and whatnot. It's because it's visual visualization. It's um, form, making sure you get the form right. Um, so. Um, I, I recall to the past because I, we look at ourselves now and go, this is what we will be. There's nothing wrong with looking to that and saying, this is where we're headed. This is what we're working on. And it seems to be molasses sometimes. It seems to be slow going. Uh, we want everything to be now, right? I want it now. I want it now. If sometimes fast food's not even fast, you know? Um, uh, they, they, uh, they don't make food fast enough. But uh, uh, a good meal takes time, a... Um, uh, a journey to a, a destination, you know, it takes time. I knew driving out uh, out west this week that it would it was going to take time. Uh, you know what I did when I took? I, I didn't put on my work clothes Monday morning when I went to work. I, I wore comfortable clothes because I knew I'm in the truck all day long. Same thing with Tuesday. I knew that it was going to take me two and a half days to reach my destination. Uh, so I wore comfortable clothes. I got comfortable. I didn't wear my work boots. I didn't wear work jeans and my, um, uh, my reflective gear. I didn't do all that uh, because I knew, hey, it's, this is hoodie and sweatpants and tennis shoes. You know, this is what this is. And I, I got comfortable. I, and, um, but uh, Phoenix came up quick. And, and I knew, hey, it's coming up quick. I need to put on my, my, my work boots need to be on. My jeans need to be on. I need to have my gloves. I need to have everything I need because I knew that the destination was going to come at some point. And uh, I think that when uh, we start to see uh, a lot of the fruit from the seeds that we have planted over the last decade uh, and, and whatnot, and, and we have seen some fruit, we have seen some um, uh, fruit on the trees, brother Alex. He's very fruity. Uh, no, ah, yeah, I'm making sure you're paying attention. Uh, but um, and, and Ernesto and and uh, Crystal and uh, Joe and and uh, Tessa and so many others, um, uh, and and even our own spiritual lives, uh, that there's growth to be had. So when I recall to the past, uh, don't ever get discouraged in your heart and say, "Oh man, I remember the good old days." Well, it, we can have those again. Um, and I'm not trying to copycat what we did. Um, I'm just the format in which we did it. Soul winning, knocking on doors, baptisms, bus routes, um, uh, uh, outreach ministries, and, and whatever else the Lord leads us to do. I'm not trying to recreate um, the past. I'm trying to create the future that the Lord has for us. I want to make sure that we're on path. There's a, a parable uh, where Jesus is talking about some servants, and he says, you don't know when the master's coming back. You don't, so don't, don't miss the train. Uh, don't miss the train. A lot of people have, have, have uh, fallen by the wayside, or as I said this morning, got discouraged of, because of the detour, and they, got, they turned around and went back. Um, and they're going to they're gonna miss the journey. They're going to miss the, the neat stuff. Uh, if I wouldn't have got up on time and left on time from... Uh, where was I? Flagstaff. And I was in uh, Oklahoma. If I wouldn't have left at the time, the exact time, which was, I think, like 10, 10 hours and 15 minutes, I thought, okay, I'll buy myself that 15 minutes. I left. If I would have left earlier or left sooner, I would have missed that, uh, or uh, later, I would have missed that meteor. And I would have missed that bobcat. And I would have missed the sun coming up just perfectly over the clouds and with that peak. I wouldn't have seen the things that I saw and experienced those things. Uh, had I, well, I don't want to do that. I'm too tired. I don't want to. Uh, and a lot of people do that in the journey, especially as a church body. Um, we are a church. It probably isn't emphasized enough. Christ died for the church. Christ died for the church. 
The church isn't mine to criticize. The church isn't mine to hate on. The church isn't mine to, to leave and, unless God has called me to leave and go to another place. It's not, this is, this is it. Well, it's the, it's, it's the believer. It's what's inside of us. Yes, it's us together. It's us together. The called out assembly coming together is the church. Um, and we should come together. We should work together. We should have goals together. And uh, so anytime that I recall to the past, it's not in a, oh, well, the, the past. It's a, no, it's, hey, the, the, God's still God. The same God that was in 1994 is the same God that's today. He can do those things all over again. Um, and uh, I, that's what I'm looking forward to. And, and you make sure that you are here when the windows of heaven open up and blessings start pouring out and uh, we can rejoice together and give glory to God together and, and, and praise God together for the great things that he has done. And if we learned anything this morning, we can also praise God and worship God like Job did this morning. Whenever he lost everything, he ran his clothes, shaved his head, fell down on the ground, and the Bible says, and worshiped, and worshiped. Uh, there were some lessons to be learned in the the last half decade, because I'd say the last five years, we've been on the right track. It was the first five years of pastor sick all the time, and he's not calling, he's going to call, and what's going to happen, and what are we doing, and where are we going, and what's the future, that there was a lot of um, um, fear, and doubt, and maybe mistake, expect, mistakes on my end. Um, and and um, uh, But um, he fell on his face and worshiped, and that God is worthy and he said to his wife, should we receive blessing of the Lord and not a curse? And should we receive good and not evil? Um, you know, when God serves us something, it's best that we just eat it. When God puts something on the plate, it's best that we, we clear it. When God puts something in our path, it's best that we don't avoid it, that, that we meet it head on. And um, we can learn from Job that you meet it head on, and he did it with worship. Um, and we can worship the Lord and praise the Lord for what's happened the last 10 years, because whatever it is, Man means it for evil, but God means it for good. God means it for good. Now, what I'm going to do is, is I think I'm going to just get us a little bit further in uh, the uh, determining what's valuable. Um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. I'm going to get a little bit further in that, and then I think I'm going to finish it next Sunday morning. Next Sunday morning. Matthew chapter 6, we'll read our, our text and then we'll pray and uh, I'll give you a, a, a quick, uh, a quick uh, rundown or review over the past two weeks and then uh, we'll hop into some new material. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven uh, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Heavenly Father, you have determined what is valuable. Your, your book has uh, uh, been the assessment. It's the appraisal book, and you are the assessor. Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you would help us to, uh, when we read, to pick up on the things that you've put out there for us, um, if we were to walk and, and see money on the ground, we wouldn't leave it laying there. If we were to um, uh, see something valuable in the way or a good deal somewhere and we had the means to get it, we would, we would do everything in our power to, to obtain it. Uh, so, Lord, when we come across the word and, and we're reading your word and we come across something that's valuable, uh, something that means something, and it, it may be heavy to pick up to begin with, uh, but help us to labor over it, to meditate on it, the Bible says, to think on it, and uh, pull a truth from it. Uh, Heavenly Father, your book is all truth, every single bit of it, from the front to the back, to the top to the bottom, and everything in between. It's all truth. Thy word is truth. Help us to learn it. Uh, help us to grasp it and then live by it, Lord. Uh, our lives would be so much better if we did. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Um, it. I, I think we can have 401ks and do it in a wise way. I think we can have pensions and do it in a wise way. I think we can have an inheritance and, have, and obtain it, or, oh, obtain it, um, uh, and receive it and manage it um, uh, in a wise way. I think we can have a well-paying job, a career, 
and have a great income and manage it correctly. Um, but whether you're on that spectrum or you're on the poverty spectrum or somewhere in between, uh, we can do it all to the glory of God. There's nothing wrong with stuff. Uh, I'm not against uh, folks who have a, a cabin on a mountainside somewhere. I'm not against um, folks who have a speedboat. I'm not against. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not against those things. And by the way, I don't think God is against those things uh, either. I don't believe that God is anti-speedboat. God is anti-speedboat over priorities. God is anti-cabin on a mountainside over priorities. Uh, and priorities are something we can get principles or we can get from the word of God. Um, there's, David said, uh, I believe it was a song, uh, but fill my cup and let it overflow. Fill my cup and let it overflow. And you know, when we get filled up from God, and I don't mean just let it overflow with love or compassion or empathy, or the Bible says in Psalm 1, 1, that uh, the man that doesn't follow after the worldly crowd will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. It says it over and over and over again that if we put God's law and his statutes and testimonies and commands and put all those things in front of us and walk after them, that not only will God provide for us, but there is excess when you obey the Lord. There is excess. You will be able to bless others. You will be able to help others. Uh, and, and many, many times I've seen it happen um, through uh, uh, my, as my father was a pastor and a business owner. I saw that happen to people who came to this church who were drug using, drug selling, alcohol using, um, uh, and, and that was just the Sunday school teachers. Uh, you know, I see. <laughs> I seen, I seen um, uh, uh, folks come to this church, give their life over to God, follow the teachings um, uh, that the pastor taught from the Bible, and turn their finances upside down, and, and made careers out of them, and, and turned into businessmen, and, and graduated from college, and did all these things. And now, since they followed, followed the principles of the Bible, they were able to help others also. There's nothing wrong with prosperity. It's, at, it's taught biblically. But it's how you, how prosperity, how do you gain that prosperity? Where does prosperity come from? Is it something because you work so hard to get? Or is it because you said, here's the principle. I'm going to live by this principle. And whether prosperity comes or I just put food on the table and pay my bills, I'm going to be loyal to principle. The principles, you say principle, yeah, the word of God. The word of God. Whether God uh, 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 gives you an, ab an abundance here or an abundance there, uh, it should be, I don't, he saved me, that's enough. I'm not have, I don't have to die and go to hell. I'm a born again Christian. He has given me everlasting life where there's no more sickness, no more suffering, no more Satan, no more sin, no more, no more, no more wickedness, no more, uh, 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 no more want. I'm going to a place where I am in the presence and the care and the comfort of Almighty God for eternity. And he says he's going to prepare a place for me. And he says, and I, I have an inheritance through the Son with the Father. That's, that's enough. I like a nice suit. I like a nice car. I like a nice house. I like, I like all those things. I, I would like to have those things. Jamie and I are talking about where, you know, where are we going to try to go for our 15-year anniversary? Um... She's just like, I want to go somewhere and just hear nothing, just crickets. You know, I don't want to, I don't just, I just want to, I'm like, all right, so Woodburn, you know, I just, <laughs> just past New Haven, Monroeville, uh, you know, uh, but um, uh, just, just, just she wants to hear nothing. And I talk about, and there's nothing wrong, nothing at all. And actually, I believe those things can be thoroughly enjoyed if our gottens aren't ill-gotten, if our, if our gottens, if you will, are our, if they've been well-gotten, if they've been given by God. Now, value, what is value? Value, something that we consider somewhat as a treasure, something that is uh, desirable, something that has uh, monetary value, um, that has um, sentimental value, a valuable, I have a... Uh, five-shot revolver that uh, my mother gave me from her father who got it from his father, correct? Is it stopped there? Or did he get it further down the line somewhere? Okay. 
Uh, it had to be because it's scratched like 1817 or something on there. Um, and it's got some notches in the... Uh, yeah. Uh, but um, you know them old Kentucky moonshiners. They, uh, they didn't play around. Uh, but uh, it, that's... Uh, I had Brother Steve Jewell look it up, and it ranged. Uh, it didn't blow my mind on how much it was. But it had it has more sentimental value to me than it does monetary value. Like, I'd never sell that. It's not worth selling it to get. I'd have to be in a really, really, really bad, hard spot to sell that. Um, and it, it's nothing. It's not like, oh, wow, look at that. It's just an old, cool, little cowboy uh, five-shot revolver type of gun. And um, uh, Smith & Wesson, I think it is. Uh, and, uh, so it's a, a neat little gun, but I'd never sell it. It has more, uh, what do we call that? What kind of value? Sentimental. I was intrins intrinsic value, uh, a sentimental value. So valuables, things that we look at and treasure. A treasure is something that has value and vice versa. So from this passage of, uh, of Matthew six, we understand that there are two kinds of treasures. Two kinds. Number one is temporary treasures or treasures that we heap up to ourselves on earth. And I, I don't know if you do. Maybe somebody's sitting on a Scrooge McDuck size of money somewhere in here tonight. I don't know if you are or not. But if you are, fantastic. Use it for the Lord. If not, you're going to lay up treasures for yourself on earth. And um, the car you buy, you'll crash. You know, I can't help but think uh, that, uh, that cool Mustang that Mr. and Mrs. Van Zulen used to have, and it hit a deer. No, a deer hit them. A deer hit them. Oh, man, come on. A cool car. Convertible. Yeah. No, it did. It crashed. I have a car. I don't know if you know this, but I have a car of my own. You haven't seen it for seven months, um, but it's waiting on some parts somewhere. Stinking. Oh, come on. It's, it's a car. Houses. You know what they do? They collect dust and the, they settle and critters try to get in and stay warm in the winter. And um, birds try to make nests and raccoons tear into the roof. And the, the, the windows leak air and um, uh, uh, all kinds. Of, you have to cut the grass and you have to uh, power wash the house and you've got to fix this and nail that up there and screw that up there and fix that and do that. Why? It's, te it's temporary stuff. Even the nicest houses, people have to come in and maintain them because they're wood, made of wood, hay, and stubble. Wood, hay, and stubble. Some people brag, oh, I have a house in this state and, and I'm this state and I've got a house over here and I've got uh, something over in Europe and, and I've got this down here and this cottage here and, and I've got this houseboat over here. And I go, good, and I feel sorry for you. <laughs> you have to pay attention to all those things and you got to um, uh, have somebody maintain all those things. And, and uh, Jay Leno has a warehouse full of cars and I like, I like cars, I'm into cars. And I, uh, he's got a, a warehouse just full of some of the most odd and end kind of things and then some really valuable um, uh, um, Americana type of muscle cars and whatnot. And, uh, but he's gotta pay attention to him. He's gotta watch after him. And if that's your life, you know, that's your life and I, that's not much of a life. But whether, no matter if it's cars or guns or a stamp collection or a garden or a um, uh, art or a real estate, no matter what it is, okay, heap up unto yourself all these things and then you die and then what? You don't get to take any of it with you. I'm not saying don't have hobbies. I'm not saying don't enjoy yourself. There's nothing wrong with that at all. It's if it consumes you. If it takes away from the eternal that Jesus was talking about here. There's temporal things. And there's eternal things. I wouldn't mind um, uh, living long enough to have some things that I, I, I do lose. Uh, I, I would like to have a, a house one day that I leave to my kids. And I know that sports car that we, we worked on and wrenched on to leave to one of my kids. And, um, um, you know, I don't know, Jamie's medical bills to leave to the kids. I, I want to have some things to leave to the kids, you know. Uh, uh, but uh, eternal things can't be destroyed. Temporal things can. Eternal can't. They stay. Now, uh, we said that God, God is the appraisal of all things. Your life, your health, your wealth, and everything in this world, God is the appraiser of it. And the Bible is the appraiser book. The Bible is the appraisal book. Uh, the Word of God appraises everything in life. Uh, the Bible gives us, uh, we talked about the value of a soul, the value of a soul. And that, that rich man that talked about, hey, I've got a great harvest. I've, 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 uh, I've, I've had more than I ever have. I'm going to tear down my old barns, my old silo, and build bigger ones to keep it all. He said, you can't, you can't keep it all. He said, you're going to die tonight. Then whose things will those be? 
You're going to die tonight. The word of God tells us the value of a soul, uh, it, it, uh, it, costs, it, it costs Jesus. That's how much a soul costs. It costs Jesus his life. Now, the world does not appreciate and appraise a soul at the same value that Jesus does. Uh, they never have, and uh, they, they absolutely never, never ever will. Um, excuse me, I have an eyelash that I just don't seem to be able to get. Uh, and we emphasized in Luke, uh, it was uh, Luke 12, Luke 12, where this, uh, the, the, the man that had this harvest said, I'm going to build up all this, and I'm going to keep this, and I'm going to do this, and these are my goals. I'm going to take my ease. He said, and then in verse number 20 of Luke 12, the Bible says, but God said, but God said, here you are making plans, Luke. You're going to make a bunch of plans for your life. Houston, you're going to make plans for your life. We're going to make plans for our life and go, this is what I'm going to do, and these are the things that I'm going to achieve. And, and listen, there's nothing wrong with goals, but if you'll just, and, and, and I'm, I'm, if you'll do it all in the will of God, have all the goals and all the dreams and all the desires and all those things that you want, if you'll do it in the will of God and say, dear God, would you help my, help my thinking, help my mind, help me to want what you want. God, I want what you want. And God, I don't want what you don't want me to have. Um, uh, but this man didn't consider God. He didn't consider his life. He didn't consider that. And he said, and he said, and he said, but God said, God said, why? Because God is the appraiser. We can walk around and say, look how valuable I am. Look how much I'm worth. Look how much I have. Look at what I've accomplished. Look, 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 look. But God is the appraiser. So if we're going to uh, uh, have the right kind of balance in life, we're going to balance ourselves correctly. We're going to have to live with purpose. We're going to have to live with purpose. Live life with purpose and live life with joy. If we want to have balance, we're going to uh, uh, live life with purpose and joy and make our life mean something. I've said it before, and I don't know if I read it somewhere or the Lord gave it to me. I don't really recall, but um, I believe it was at um, uh, Brother White's uh the next Sunday uh, after the passing of Brother White, where I kind of paid homage to him and I talked about maintaining the cause. Uh, and I said, you know, we, we, we have the date that he was born and we have the date that he passed away. I was like, but it's the dash in the middle that tells the story. It's that dash in the middle that tells the story of, the, of that life. Um, and uh, uh, what we do with our life, Sure, you have your day, the day you were born and, and the day that you die. But if we're going to have joy and purpose and live life with meaning, we have to determine, we have to find out and determine what is valuable. What is valuable? What, what does God say about uh, what is valuable? Now, um, I talked last week, I began with where do you spend your time? Where and how do you spend your time? What are you doing with your time? Are you spending it wisely? And then I got into point number one. Point number one was obedience to principle takes time. Obedience to principle takes time. Uh, it's not something you just, um, in, in many cases, most cases, it's not something you just hop on the horse and start riding. Um, you know, we see guys riding horses, uh, you know, whatever, on um, uh, grit. We have the grit because we don't do cable and stuff like that. So we get, you know, antenna television stuff and there's grit. And those guys, man, they hop on a horse and whoosh, they're off to the races, you know. But you know those guys had to learn how to ride horses? The first time that horse took off on them, you know what they looked like? <laughs> All over the place. They didn't know what they're doing. Uh, Brother Pip, I bet at some point you had to grow sea legs, did you not? Being out at sea, you had to learn. All right, the boat's rocking this way. This I walk with it. You know, I, I, you get your sea legs and your sea stomach. It takes time to develop these things. You know, so obedience to principles in the Bible takes time because, number one, you don't know all of them. You don't know all the principles of the Bible. Next, you don't understand all the principles of the Bible. Why? Why that? Why? You don't know them. You don't understand them. So, therefore, you don't know how to, perfor to perform them. So, it takes time to live life uh, uh, to, or to have obedience to principle, obedience to principle. All right. Number two, number two, number two tonight, number two, um, uh, obedience takes time, but obedience takes all the time. You say obedience takes all the time. Yeah. Listen up. Uh, I said last week, quit trying to hurry up 
and do these things. Read your Bible and have a relationship with your wife and, and be a father and be a mother and, and, and have a career and, and quit trying to hurry, 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 hurry. Uh, quit trying to rush the valuable things in life. Where are you trying to get to so fast? What, what are you trying? I want to hurry up and do nothing. Notice I said to the kids the other day, uh, oh, what was it? Something was, oh, uh, okay, here you go, this morning. I'll just use this morning's uh, illustration. I walk into the closet, big closet, and there's a laundry basket pushed up against a rug, and it's got the rug curled over. And I walk in and say, did anybody see that? Does, did anybody see that? Yes, I saw that. Okay, then why didn't you fix it? Because I didn't do it. Okay, but you saw it, right? Yes, okay, if you saw it, it is now your problem. If you saw it, it's your problem. I, I, won't, I won't run off and say, well, it's laziness, bless God. No, it's being a kid and not going, oh, maybe I should do something about that. Seeing trash on the floor, seeing, hey, that baby's going to fall off the platform there. I better, not my problem, not my baby. No, you're going to do something about it. you got to stop it. you got to do something about it. You can't just allow that to happen. Um, I, uh, was it last night? It was last night. Uh, we went down to uh, La Bria La Cabana or Bria La Cabana or whatever it is, the Mexican res restaurant down the street. And uh, she was putting some stuff up on the counter and she knocked some of these styrofoam cups over. And I was standing in line waiting to, place my, waiting to pick up my order and I kind of looked over there. I'm like, <laughs> fine. I went over there and I picked them up. And of course she said, thank you. And I said, no problem. You know, I said, if there were a few more feet away, I wouldn't have done it. You know, and she, we got a laugh out of that, you know, and, um, uh, she said, what, 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 did you place an order? I said, yeah, I did. And she took, she went and took care of my stuff, um, out of, out of, I was in line and she went and took care of it. And she said, I only did this because you helped me. I said, oh, so you're only being nice to me because I was nice to you? I said, that's wrong. You know, and, 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 um, you know, and, we, and I said, that was my good deed for the day. I said, don't, you know, I'm not doing any more. And then, um, uh, so we had a good conversation, you know, just kind of got some laughs about it. But um, I, you see a problem, you got to fix that problem. But it's ta it takes time for me as a parent to tell these guys, if you see a problem, fix the problem, if you can. And if you can't fix the problem, go find somebody who can. You see that it, it takes time. Being a parent is not a sometime thing. It's not like, well, I'm going to be a parent until eight o'clock. And then at that point, I'm done. Um, you know, and so I tell these guys, um, wh where are you in such a hurry that you, you can't pick that up? To the couch? To a video game? I know it's not to, to books and academic things. Um, academic uh, uh, subjects. I know it's not for you to go, you know, chop wood somewhere. I know you're not doing it. You're not going to paint. You're not going to uh, uh, twist a screwdriver or uh, 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 swing a hammer somewhere. What are you doing that you can't stop and pick that up? It takes time to teach it. And not only does it take time to teach it, once they grasp it, it's going to take time to keep house. It's going to take time to do your studies. It's going to take time. But to what end? What end? There, folks, when it comes to um, when it takes when it comes to obedience, there is no end. There's no end to obedience. It's obedience. Obedience takes all the time we have. And I'll, with that, I'll say, when we give all our time to obedience, it keeps us safe. It keeps us safe from the temptations of the devil and from giving in. It doesn't just take a lot of time. It takes all your time. All your time. Now, if you follow God's word, we will have no time to do anything else. You'll have no time to do anything else. None whatsoever. Uh, if you, um, hmm. uh, so obedience takes all your time. All your time. You have no, you no, have no time to do anything else. No time to uh, get distracted. They say that an idle mind is the devil's workshop. Idle hands are the devil's uh, uh, tools. But um, we're supposed to obey all the time anyway. Lucas doesn't go, all right, dad, that's it. 9 p.m., I'm done obeying. He doesn't do that. He's got to obey all the time. Why? Because he's my kid. So why is it that with us, God's kids, we go, okay, God, I'm going to obey um, tithe, but I'm not obeying forgiveness. Or I'll obey, uh, I'll obey forgiveness, 
but I'm not obeying um, soul winning. Come on now, you can't like be in love with forgiveness and then not go tell people they're forgiven. Um, uh, you can't, uh, you, you, we can't pick and choose what we want to obey and what we don't want to obey. We obey. Obedience is something that we do all the time. Everything we do in life ought to be done within the scope of the will of God. So I've said before, put God at the forefront of all that you do. All that you do, whether it's buying a car or buying a house or, um, you know, we've been looking uh, all kinds of different real estate situations. And uh, uh, I'm talking hundreds, hundreds. And I go, no, 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 no. And some like some good stuff too. Um, but it's more than I want to pay. It's more than, uh, I just said, it's not it. 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 And well, when do you know? I'll know when I know. When, when the light comes on, so to speak, when God says this is the one, when God leads us to it, when God leads us to the right place, the right thing, the right situation, that'll be it. Um, and I, I do the same thing as, as uh, vehicles. I do the same thing uh, in, in almost everything in my life. I go, okay, what, what should I wear today? You know, I, I, I was thinking about, I was like, what do I wear on Sunday? Yesterday I was thinking, what do I wear? And immediately I went, you know, I, haven't, I, I don't think I've, maybe once I have worn that black tie with yellow polka dots on it. And I pull down my tie box and I open it up and this tie is laying on top. Now, did I put it away last week and this was on top and somehow my brain remembered that it was on top and it recalled the memory? I don't know. But I thought, hey, I'm going to, this is the tie I'm going to wear. And I open it up and this was the tie on top. So I'm like, all right, cool. This is what I'll wear. And then I second guessed it. I went, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to wear my brown suit, a white shirt, and my brown and blue tie. I think that'll look pretty sharp. And I was like, no. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back to wearing this. You, like, you sound like you can't choose, Brother Jackson. No, I, I, I get it. I know, I know. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm petty about it. I, I don't know. But I, God, what do you, what? And it's just a feeling. It's just this, a confidence in saying, this is it. This is the one. I know that this is the way. I know that this is the way that I should take. I know that this is it. I, I just have a confidence about it. Uh, when you have no evidence or proof to back it up besides to say, I believe God wants me to. I believe God has called me to. I believe this is where the Lord would have us move or this is what the Lord would have us to do. Back a few years ago, right before the pandemic, uh, the summer of 19, we were looking at that building in New Haven and um, there were a few people who were like, hey, how exciting and this would be fun. And it was, it was exciting to go look. Well, it's always nice to window shop. It's always nice to go, ooh, wow, hmm, let's imagine. But I'm like, no, no, this is not it. This is not it. <laughs> so I called up Mr. Emeritus, and I said, Mr. Emeritus. And he said, uh, yes, senior pastor. And I said, <laughs> I said, hey, actually, it was more like, yo, pops, yo, dad. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but this whole situation is, no, I, no, this isn't right. I said, I don't think God's in it. I don't think God wants us to. I just, I don't, it's, it's not sitting right with me. And it's not one of those nervous faiths. It's one of those, no, this is, no, I don't think we should. I, I don't think we should. And he said, oh, I'm so glad you said that because I didn't think we should either. I'm like, well, why are you pushing it then? Quit it. Uh, he gets excited, you know. But um, uh, so whether it's buying a building or, or uh uh, hey, who you should marry or where you should go to school one day or what career you should, what career path you should follow or whatever it is, do all in the scope or in the will of God. God, what would you have me to do? Uh, I don't think um, uh, uh, anything that we do ought to violate the word of God. We ought not live outside of the word of God. So if we don't ever live outside of it, we're always in obedience with it. Obedience takes all your time. Lucas, how much time does obedience take? How much, Houston? All your time. Obedience all the time. Did you know you can obey mom and dad and your teachers and your authorities without having them in your face actually telling you what to do? Because you can look at that trash on the ground and go, I believe it is the will of my father that I pick up that trash. I can see, you know, Deacon on the stage or the platform or getting ready to fall over or getting ready to do something and go, I believe it is the will of my mother and the will of my father that I save him from doing that. It's obedience, saying, I know what the will of my authority is, so therefore I am going to perform obedience without having them verbally tell me to do it. For him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. When you look at something and go, I know that I'm supposed to, but I'm not going to because I don't want to, or somebody else ought to, 
or I'm willing to pay the consequences, that's disobedience. It's disobedience. So the word of God, obedience takes all our time. The Christian life is not something that you add to the life that you have. The Christian life is something you now live. Um, uh, uh, Christ did not buy me for, for, for me to do what I want to do. Uh, he bought me for me to be owned by him. What? No, you not. You are not your own. You've been bought. We have such a pompous attitude in this country that nobody owns me. Nobody claims me. Nobody, I heard a song. I don't know who sang it. I don't know when it was or where it was or uh, how old the song was. Basically, I think it was a country song. Uh, basically, he, I, I, he doesn't bow to anyone. There's nobody he bows to besides, you know, the one above. But the fact of the matter is, no, you don't. Just because you reference God in your song does not mean you reverence God in your life. I don't want to hear that. These guys, I don't bow America and guns and freedom and yeah, America, and we're going to do what we want. We ain't standing up for communism and, um, uh, you know, we're a constitutional republic and nobody will tell us what to do and don't tread on me and the Statue of Liberty and the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence and God bless America. You just throw that God bless America in there and you ain't got no reverence for God. You couldn't quote a Bible verse to stink and save your life. These guys, I, 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 I stand for God and kneel. Or I, I, I stand for the flag and kneel for God. No, you don't, because you don't even go to church on Sunday, punk. You don't kneel for God. You don't kneel for God. Get the Bible's, uh, uh, Joshua said it and David said it, and it's written throughout Scripture about obeying the word of God and, and um, uh, his statutes and his commandments, and people don't do it. They don't do it. They're a bunch of fakes and facades and liars. All they are is lip service. It sounds good. God, guns, girls, and glory, and gold, and all that garbage t-shirts, and all those stupid coffee mugs. All you are is merchandise to an agenda. It's all you are. All you are. Uh, for everybody from the leftist, uh, far left Antifa crowd to the far right wing nut jobs living in the woods playing army man militia somewhere, and everybody in between who's somewhat normal, there's a very small group of people who have an actual reverence for God. You make sure you're one of them. Well, how do I do that? Obedience, obedience, obedience to the Lord, obedience to his book. You cannot obey God if you do not read your Bible. You cannot obey God. You cannot love your wife. You cannot raise your kids and rear your kids. And by the way, you can't even be a real uh, um, a patriot, a real patriot for your country if you don't know what God's will is. Uh, uh, by the way, I am an, a, I'm a patriot. I'm a heavenly patriot, then I'm an American patriot. I love America, but I, like heaven, but I love heaven more. I, I, I revere um, uh, uh, our, our country's forefathers, but I revere my heavenly father more. I fear my heavenly father more. Not saying that uh, God didn't use many of the men and women uh, uh, throughout our country's history to do great and wonderful things, to build us up to be a great country. Uh, but we are so infested and infected by the disease of sin in this country, we've become poisoned by prosperity that we have forgotten God. We've forgotten him. And our country is sin sick. And there's only one way back to him. And it's a, it's a huge heaping dose of the B-I-B-L-E. Uh, uh, it takes obedience all the time. Obedience takes all the time, all the time, all the time. You don't just add Jesus to your life. You let Jesus become your life. Uh, when I, when I bought my car, I didn't leave it at the dealership and just tell them to let anybody use it. I wanted the car. It was mine. I took it home. I drove it. I put miles on it. I put fuel in it. I washed it. I took care of it. I vacuumed it out. I, I did everything to it. Why? Cause I owned it. I owned it and God owns you and God owns me. God can do whatever he wants with us. He, anything. Why? Because he owns us. The Bible says in Galatians 20, uh, or 220, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me and the life, which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That every Christian, that ought to be a mantra of yours. I am not my own. I belong to him. I am not my own. I belong to him. One of the major problems we have in the Christian life is trying to figure out who's the boss. Am I the boss? Is my wife the boss? Is Uncle Sam the boss? Is my boss at work the boss? My employer the boss? Is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, is the dollar my boss? Is my pension, is my retirement, is my 401k my boss? 
Who's my boss? We try to figure out who I, who I belong to, who owns me. Well, I'll tell you this morning, born again Christian, Christ owns you. Christ owns you. You belong to Christ. And uh, 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 any Christian that's got a brain on their head or a brain in their head would say, I would much rather have Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and Master and Owner than sin and the devil. I would much rather have Jesus as my master than myself. I've been known, I don't know, I, I know this may be hard for you to believe, but I've been known to make a bad decision or two. I've been, I've been known to make a mistake or two. I've been, Jamie, you close your ears. I've been known to have been wrong a time or two. Uh, uh, I've been known to, to mess things up or to go, oh man, I should, oh no, uh-oh. When God never has an uh-oh. God never messes anything up. God never looks back and goes, oh, well, doggone it, didn't mean to do that. Nope, God did it, and God did it on purpose, and God knows what he is doing. I'd, rather, I'd much rather have God uh, and, and, and Jesus Christ, my Savior, as my master and at the helm and at the controls of my life. Uh, sin and the devil has led me nowhere but to heartache and pain and tears and, and um, uh, uh, sleepless nights and dis being distraught and discouraged. Sin and the devil were going to send us straight to hell for all of eternity. And uh, that's, uh, that's nothing. I, I could do nothing about that. Uh, so Jesus came down and, and he rescued me and he rescued anybody who would call upon him. Jesus came along and said, I'll pay his debt. I'll pay her debt. I'll pay their debt. The worst criminal in the world can have their debt paid. They may, they may owe a debt to society that they have to pay, but their sin debt can be taken care of. Their sin debt can be taken care of. The most um, uh, hardened drunk can have their sin debt taken care of. Drug dealers can have their sin debt taken care of. Wife beaters can have their sin taken care of. Now, you can't go back and undo the harm that you've done, Mr. Drunk and Mr. Drug Dealer and Drug User and Wife Beater and uh, uh, mothers. And we've heard all kinds of stories. I don't even want to call them mothers, but women who have bore children and then took that newborn baby and put it in a ditch or put it in a trash can or just abandoned that baby. The, what, a, what a terrible, what a terrible messed up thing to do. But I can tell you this, it's not so terrible and it's not so messed up that God, through his son, Jesus Christ, couldn't have that sin forgiven. You say, well, no way. The Bible said where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. You can't out -sin God's grace unless you, there's one sin, one. It's not suicide. It's not taking God's name in vain. It's not adultery. It's not fornication. It's not murder. It's not drugs or alcohol. It's not skipping church. It's not stealing from God. It's saying, I reject Jesus Christ as the Savior. That right there is what sends a person to hell. Man, woman, or child who hears the gospel and says, I will not depend, and I will not call, and I do not believe on Jesus Christ to be my Savior. That right there is what condemns a, a, a man, a woman, or a child to hell. That's it. Once you have the ability to hear the gospel, process the gospel, and either accept or deny the gospel, that right there depends, that, that all hinges on where you go. Your, how you respond to the gospel. Will you accept it or will you deny it? Jesus came along and say, I'll pay your sin debt. I'll pay that sin debt. I'll take you as mine. I'll bring you into my own. I'll give you a home where I have a home. I'll give you a robe where I have a robe. I'll give you a crown where I have a crown. I'll give you peace where I have peace and joy and love and comfort and light where I have all those things and I'll give you an inheritance with the Father. Um, uh, that's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said. And I'll tell you right now tonight, I, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I think it's a crying shame when Christ, who has bought us and paid our sin debt, and we go over here and live for the devil. People say um, uh, uh, all the time, well, I can get saved, and, and I know that I'm saved, but I'm going to go live how I want, and I'll come back to Christ. I'll come back to God. I'll, come, I'll get religion again one day. You don't have one day, Mr. Luke chapter 12. You, it's the same thought process. I'll come back some other day. I have my, I'll take my ease now. No, you won't. You're dying tomorrow. You're going to die next year. You're going to go cause a bunch of problems out here to now and come back to the church scarred and marred. And, um, uh, uh, and a lot of people who go out and get scarred and marred think that they're barred from the church. 
Oh, the walls would fall in around me. Stop it with that stupid thinking. No, they wouldn't. If they haven't fallen on, fallen in on the pastor, they're not going to fall in on you. Well, the pastor, that's the best Christian in the church. Many times it's not. Many times it's, it's, a, it's somebody saying, dear God, you want me? You calling me? <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah, you. Yeah, you. Many times, you know, I, I, I thought about myself as a pastor and went, dear God, I... I can't be a pastor. I'm not, I'm not, I didn't go to school. And I, there's all kinds of things that disqualify me. And, and um, uh, um, I, I, I almost cheered for the Packers one time. And I, uh, uh, you know, I just, <laughs> uh, all kinds of, you know, God, I can't do that. You know, God knew who he was calling when he called me. Did you know God knows who he's talking to when he talks to you? It never occurred to God. Nothing, did it ever occur to you that nothing occurred to God? I don't go to God and go, dear God, I, I'm marred. God goes, I know. God, I can't be a pastor. I'm, I, look at me. God's like, yeah, I know. I, I know, but I'll, I, can, I can clean you up. I can take care of you. But folks, I'm, what I'm saying is, is, is uh, uh, the long way around is we can't go out and, and I, one pastor said, I don't know who said it. Um, uh, I wish I could give him to credit. But he said, you can't go shack up with the devil and expect God to pay the rent. You can't go live with the devil and think God's just going to make everything hunky-dory. Oh, ooh, I better slow down because I want to run off on this trail right now because I'm, 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 I'm righteous anger over a situation that I would like to choke the life into somebody. I didn't say choke the life out of. I said choke the life into um, about their situation and go, man, let the lights come on in your head and don't you see where you're headed? Don't you see the life that you're living and, 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 and the trail you're blazing, so to speak, uh, uh, the highway to hell for your wife and your kids and your life and your family and the future that you're, you're molding for, for what's gonna come? Don't you see what's down there? And people think, well, I... Why doesn't God give me what I need? Because you're not living for him. Why isn't God taking care of me? Because you're not living for him. You're not living in obedience and you're not even making an effort for it. Why do you think God's going to do it? The Bible says draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Not stay away and expect God to come the whole stinking hundred yards and take care of you. He's not going to do that. There's a if my people and then God will. If we'll do our part, God will do his part. When we don't, when we, when the promises of God fail, it's not because the promises of God have failed. It's because we have. It's because we came up short. It's because we stopped too early. It's because we got discouraged in the detour and decided to turn around and go back. It's because we did. God's never failed and he never, never, ever will. So, uh, 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 so many Christians, and it's a shame, it's a, it's a serious shame that Jesus Christ paid my sin debt and, and, and then I go out and live for the devil. I mean, I hate the devil. Man, I hate him. I hate him. I hate the devil. I hate my flesh. And I don't mean I hate my, my person. I hate the strength of the flesh. I hate my fleshly desires. I hate it. Sometimes my mind wanders and go, I wonder what life would be like. Would I be a, would I be one would I be a good old boy? I'd have a few tattoos and 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 have my parties on the weekends and and but what kind of man example would I be setting for my kids if my my life did not revolve around Christ? If I did not try to live for the Lord, if God was not in my conversations, if I did not pray, if I did not read my Bible, if I did not, if I did not preach, and we always say in our minds, well, if I if I didn't do that, I'd still go to church. No, you wouldn't. You would eventually fall out like everybody else. Yeah, yes, you would. Uh, 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 and, and, and by the grace of God, we would, we could, and, and, and we could come back, which would be a wonderful thing. But I think to myself sometimes, I wonder what my life would be like if I, if I lived out in the world. What kind of person would Jake Jackson be if he lived out in the world? And I have my own estimates, and I have my own ideas about the kind of guy that I would be. Um, uh, but uh, that's just it. Because the devil doesn't make you think about being the, the mean, surly, uh, violent, drunk, and hardcore drug-using, um, uh, uh, swearing, cursing, wife-beating, child-kicking, um, uh, dog-kicking kind of husband that you would be. The, the devil doesn't show you divorce. He shows you a good time. The devil doesn't tempt you with, um, uh, uh, with, with laughing around the bonfire with your friends and, and passing the bottle around the fire. He doesn't tempt you with that. 
or he tempts you with that. He doesn't show you the car accidents. He doesn't show you the jail time. He doesn't show you the tears. He doesn't show you the bloodshed. He doesn't show you the black eyes. He doesn't show you those. He doesn't show you the busted teeth. He doesn't show you the scarred and marred faces and the mangled bodies by DUIs and DWIs and driving high and doing all those things. He doesn't show you those things. When the devil took Jesus up to the temple mount and took him up to the mountain, he, did, he showed him the lights from far away. He didn't take him down to the dark alleys. All those lights that the devil showed Jesus up on the mountain, those weren't fireworks, those were gunshots. All the noises that he heard from far away, they, they, that wasn't laughter, that wasn't a good time, that wasn't a party. Those were, sound, those were sounds of war and sorrows of moaning and sorrow of tears and whining and complaining and crying and screaming and pain and anguish. That's what the devil, that's what the devil gives. What he sells you is snake oil. Hey, look what I have. I can give you a good time. And he doesn't. And he doesn't. And how do I ever fall into that? Because you stopped obeying. You stopped obeying. You stopped obeying. So many people want to say over the years that, oh, you know, all these people fell out of church and they quit going to church because they were following a man and they were following Pastor Jackson. And there is truth to that. Smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. There is truth to that. Absolute truth, no doubt about it. But the fact of the matter is they are where they are now because they stopped obeying. You stopped obeying. See, they stopped They stopped obeying the pastor because the pastor was no longer there to preach what the Bible had to say about whatever given matter because the pastor is ordained by God with certain um, knowledge and abilities to be able to say something from the pulpit that he got from the spirit during the week that talks to the hearts of the people that come in from the week and they have, oh, holy cow, how do you know he was talking? How do you know what was going on in my life? Holy cow, pastor, you were talking to me today. No, I wasn't. The Holy Spirit was. The Holy Spirit was, and people fall out, and they fall into drugs, and they fall into alcohol, they fall into bitterness, they fall into all these things because they, got, they stopped obeying. That's simply what it is. Stopped obeying. And when we stop obeying, we stop putting seeds in the ground that harvest us a blessing in the future. So many Christians, far too many Christians, they've been set free from Egypt. Man, you've been set free from Egypt. But one pastor said, you're still making the bricks for Pharaoh. Still making the, the bricks for fair. That was uh, Pastor um, Jeff Fugate, Lexington, Kentucky. So if I obey the will of God for my life, if I'll uh, uh, take all my life to do it, you see, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint, the Christian life. If I obey the will of God for my life, it's going to take all my life to do it. You're not just going to get to a place and go, all right, I obeyed the Lord, now what? Keep on obeying once you've obeyed what you know what to do, keep on, keep on obeying until you know what to do again. Just keep it on. Repetition, 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 repetition. If we, obey, if we obey the will of God for our life, it's going to take all of our life to do it. All of it to do it. But I'll tell you this, and I only know from what I've heard and um, some experiences of my own, um, uh, and it's not saying the devil doesn't attack. It's not saying that he doesn't ever tempt you or try to draw you away. But if we live the Lord, live for the Lord, and we live it in obedience the best that we can, it'll be overall, it'll be a happy life. It'll be a happy life. It'll be a, a, a purpose, a purposeful, purpose filled life. I don't want to live an empty life. I don't want to live an empty life. And I don't mean, of course, by the world's standards. Hang what the world says is, is valuable about me. Uh, Amer there's a big show that people go to, America's Got Talent. And they say, oh, wow, look at your abilities. That's, could, could that be worth a million dollars in a contract in Vegas or whatever? They say that your act is worth, is valuable. It's valuable. And that's cool. There's some pretty talented people out there. I mean, some crazy stuff that people can do. Some really neat stuff, talented people. But when it comes to Jake Jackson, when it comes to me, I don't care what the world, I don't, I don't care what the world says. That, oh, you, you're this valuable, Jake. You know, when they want your life, in, when you get life insurance and that you get up to a certain dollar amount, they want to know all your assets. They, are you worth it? No, sucker, I'm worth every insurance company there is. I'm worth, I'm, I'm, yes, I am. I am worth it. Don't you know who I am? No, Mr. Jackson, who are you? I'm a son of God. <laughs> now, you can't go in there and say that. They'd be like this. 
this guy needs mental insurance. Um, you know, this guy's cuckoo, uh, you know, but uh, uh, no, oh, they want to know how much you're worth. The world says, this is how much you're worth. They do that on contracts in sports all the time. This is how much you're worth, how much you're worth. God says, I know how much you're worth. But how much do you think, Jake, Three Rivers Baptist Church, how much value do you put on what I have said is valuable? Do we think that what God has to say is valuable? I want my life to be a purpose-filled life. A life and a life that is lived in obedience is not a life that's lived with regrets. It's not a life. When you live in obedience to the Lord, and you know it, you don't, you don't have to regret it. You don't have to regret it. Now, how, how sad is it? How incredibly sad that people spend their life Doctors Without Borders, Humanitarian Aid, the Red Cross, you know, all these different things, these, these um, charities and purpose, purpose-filled lives, but they're only helping the temporal. They're only helping the temporal. And I'm all for it. By the way, I, I'm all for St. Jude's. I'm all for, um, um, uh, uh, oh, what's that fellow's name? Big sports uh, situation with raising money for cancer. Um, Vivano, Vi, um, Vivano, oh, Jackson, I can't remember his name. Um, but Dick Vitale and, and many others, they, they head that up. Um, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm all for charity. I'm all for, for helping people. I'm all for um, coats in the wintertime and, and gloves and hats and, and a place to stay and filling people's bellies with food and, and, and ministering to people. That's a part of the Christian life is ministering to people. But the whole point of ministering is so we can secure the soul. Better to die like Lazarus and live forever where he's living than to live like the rich man and die and go where he went. What's valuable? We know what a soul is valuable. But as we move along and, 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 and we live our Christian life, you've got to determine, what am I investing in? Am I investing in the eternal or am I investing in the temporal? It, I'll go as far as saying this. Uh, let's, say, uh, let's say I ran into $100,000. Um, I found it, you know, in Lucas's sock drawer. You know, I don't know. Uh, but I, 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 I got it. Let's say I came into $100,000. Do you know, it, and I, 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 I can almost guarantee you I wouldn't because there are things that I need. But it wouldn't be a mistake to give 100% to missions, to the bus ministry, to um, the, uh, the uh, fixing of the building. It wouldn't be a mistake. Now, I personally wouldn't because there's... I'm 35. I, as far as I know, I have a life to live. I need to invest some of that. I need to save some of that. I need to um, buy a new hot rod. You know, I, <laughs> I need to, you know, get that nose job I've always wanted, you know. Uh, I <laughs> yeah, uh, Brother Pip's like, your nose is kind of crooked, isn't it? Uh, no, but um, I, I want there all these things I'd want to do, you know, if I came across things like that. But it's not a mistake. It's never a mistake to invest your time, your talent, or your treasure into eternal things. Never. What's valuable? What's valuable? Obedience is valuable to God. Will you decide, have you decided, to say, if obedience to principle takes time, and obedience takes all my time, is that something that I can do? Yes, you can. But it's going to take time. Be patient. Run your race with patience, the race that is set before you. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for uh, the Word of God. I'm thankful for all the, the truths that are laid up in there to help us be better people better Christians. Uh, Lord, uh, it, it, there's just so much, so many subjects and so many topics that consist of this life. How do we live it? Uh, Lord, thank you for the book that put it all together for us. 
Thank you for the Bible. A powerful book. There's no book like it. And there'll never be one like it. Lord, thank you for making it accessible to us. Thank you for using this country in a mighty way uh, to send out missionaries and to build churches and see untold numbers of people saved. Lord, what a, what a history, what a message, what a truth, and what a promise that you are who you said you are. You're going to do what you've said you're going to do, and you're going to come back again and take us out of here and then come back and reclaim it all and make it all new again. And Lord, we look forward to that. Lord, help us to be smart enough, wise enough, to invest in eternity and not just to spend up all our time, our talent, and our treasure for the temporal things, but to invest in those things, in the eternal things, and then to understand it's going to take us time. There's going to be learning curves. There's going to be things that, that attempt to stunt our growth. There's going to be times that we fall down uh, or it's, we're going to have a hard time grasping a truth. Uh, Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you'd be patient with us. Help us to claim Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, that your mercies are new every morning. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being the God that you are. Thank you for loving us and saving us. Now, Lord, we ask that your kingdom comes. We want it to come tonight. I do. Come back tonight. Come get us out of here. It's better to be in heaven than here. Uh, but in the meantime, help us to obey you Help us to obey you in all that we know to do. Control our thinking, uh, what we do, what we say. Uh, Lord, um, uh, give us a good week this week as we go out and in and back and forth. Lord, give us safety. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.